if you are listening to this, you're listening to a webinar that is a repeat of a talk that Corey and I gave at the market research event uh, a couple months ago, live. Um, so I am Dennis Furia. I am Senior Director of Lean Growth here at the Garage Group. Um, and I was very fortunate to work with Corey um, from Cargill. Uh, and I'll let you introduce yourself in a second, Corey. Um, but work with you, gosh, you know, over the past year and a half or so. Um, and, and have some amazing results to show for it. So um, the results were good enough that, that Corey and I got together to, to talk about them uh, from stage. So Corey, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Corey Lummel, uh, Director of uh, Consumer Insights for the Cargill Protein Group. I've been here for about uh, two and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, in various insights roles at General Mills for about 17 years and then two years at Kraft. So I, I've got about uh, uh, 20 years in the industry. Mm -hmm. and, and Corey, you really, when you came to Cargill, you, you really started up the, the insights department in many ways, right? Yeah, I, I would I, I say that the insights department was uh, fairly non-existent. <laughs> I think the advertising agency was actually doing some research uh, but yeah, I was hired by our, our CMO and the protein group to actually kind of start up a function. So uh, that's been a lot of fun. Um, hired a team. I'll talk more about my team, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, been a lot of fun. Yeah. And I mean, why don't I, we'll just put the, you know, we won't bury the lead. We'll put the headline up front. Um, for an organization, you know, Cargill, someone might think of initially as a, as a relatively traditional organization. Um, but you guys were able to move in some really non-traditional ways. Uh, in fact, through the process that we went through together, you guys had six new products live in restaurants just two weeks from the ideation session that we did together. Uh, and then two of those went on to be sold into ma a major distributor just four weeks after that. Uh, and I believe since then we have even more products uh, kind of from that ideation session uh, pending sale. Um, so that is, that is the reason that we're here today. That is the results that got us to, um, to feel like this is worth sharing. Uh, it's just some incredible speed really over the course of, of a month and change, um, getting from a complete blank page to ideas that were uh, live in the market. Um, it's, it's something to be really proud of. Um, and to that yeah. end, let you, Corey, talk about how you kind of started up and, and started setting the, the vision for Cargill and, and even talk a little bit about Cargill. Yeah, I'll pretty quickly give an overview of Cargill uh, and Cargill Protein. I, um, I know I, I worked at General Mills for 17 years and I have to admit, I, I didn't know a lot about Cargill, uh, even though that the headquarters was uh, just only a few miles away. Uh, so um, I like to think of, uh, I've heard people say that Cargill is probably one of the biggest companies that most people have never heard of. Um, I think if we were in the, the Fortune 500, we'd be in the top five, uh, but we are a privately held company. It's still a uh, family involved in the business. Uh, but we're a global company, 160,000 employees across 70 countries uh, in food, agriculture, industrial, really a wide wide array of products. I am in the protein group, uh, which is focused on food, specifically beef, uh, turkey, eggs, and then cooked meats. So think things like uh, deli meat and the like. Uh, and we operate across retail food service and food ingredients. Um, a lot of B2B, but also uh, we do have a few uh, consumer brands, specifically in Turkey. So it it's been a learning journey for me, uh, which has been fun as well to uh, work on some more B2B businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few fun stats about Cargill Protein and our products. You know, four and a half billion pounds of ground of, of beef, which is amazing. 20 million plus turkeys. I think my favorite stat uh, is Cargill hide. So we use the whole animal try to uh are used to produce uh baseballs for major league baseball actually uh which is pretty cool and uh if you have leather seats in your car or 
ha leather handbags, uh, you may have uh, Cargill hides uh, with you every day. So I, I keep on wider range. Uh, when are you going to get us a, a a baseball innovation project? But I guess it's not quite. <laughs> <laughs> How fun would that be? I know it'd be pretty That's sweet. Laugh. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Cargill, Cargill is not small by any any sense of the word. Yeah, and then and then talk a little bit about how you focus the strategy for Cargill when it comes to to innovation. Yeah, so this uh, is kind of a high level view of our of our strategy and Cargill Protein, uh, really putting the customer at the center and really trying to prioritize our customers and be customer first. And, uh, uh, you know, where, where my team plays a big role is uh, bringing the consumer or the shopper perspective. And we've had a lot of positive momentum there recently, um, helping Cargill show up as a, as a value added partner to our customers uh, is probably the most important thing that we do. And uh, my insights team has uh, got a lot of positive momentum in that area recently. And then capabilities, kind of the third C here. And I think all of these, you'll hopefully you'll see, will come into play as Dennis and I present uh, how we put the customer first, uh, the customer's customer, consumers, and developing a sprint capability that is really uh, transforming um, our process and our culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this this shows uh, or kind of speaks a little bit to your team and the shared goals of that team. Yeah. So our purpose overall is uh, to help us make better decisions that propel business growth. Uh, so that could be decisions internally that we make. It could be uh, decisions that uh, we inform for our customers. Uh, we do have the biggest insights team at Cargill. There's five of us. Uh, and you can see our shared goals there that that line up with the previous slide. Uh, for insight specifically trying to increase our visibility with our customers, uh, developing more insight-led, consumer-led uh, innovation, which hadn't been the case before our team existed, and then uh, building capabilities with a focus on agility and speed. So I think hopefully you'll see all of that come through in the, in the case study that we share. And the Garage Group has been instrumental uh, in, in helping us, uh, achieve that. Yeah. We kind of slotted into that partner network that that's cited under goals for, for building capabilities. Um, and I, I think that's probably a good segue for, for me to give a little bit about the garage group and then also to talk about how we worked together and how we set the vision for this project, uh, up front. So, so the garage group fundamentally exists to help larger, more established companies to innovate and grow more like a startup. Um, you know, we believe that, that every big co, um, no matter the size, has that ability to be more entrepreneurial, to innovate faster, and to keep pace uh, with innovation that we oftentimes associate with smaller, more active counterparts. Um, with the right set of tools, frameworks, and approaches from the startup world, intelligently applied, we believe that anyone can have that kind of speed and agility. Um, and certainly that's what we saw out of, out of Cargill. Um, our, our work kind of takes, takes place across three main pillars, um, but the big theme across them is that we help big coast check the we can't do that attitude at the door um, and instead bring the, the courage, you know, our, our shirts will say courageous minds only on them oftentimes, um, you know, bring the courage to actually leverage these startup approaches. Um, that could be across you know, building out a pipeline of ideas. Um, that could be across setting the initial strategy overall and just, and just even defining a direction to ideate against. And that could, could take the form of building internal capability and, and giving the skill sets to employees and partners to operate more like a startup. Um, and I believe the project that we did with Cargill really crossed all three of those buckets in a big way. Uh, an another thing that makes the Garage Group unique is the fact that we don't have a single silver bullet process. We actually have a broad toolkit of approaches and you can see a list of some of them here on the screen, but all of these are approaches that have been tested um, through time and, and, and through execution in the startup world. 
um, you know, be it jobs to be done, which is kind of very tried and true, be it you know, startup thinking or startup owners manual, kind of newer uh, events, maybe like a Google Venture Sprint approach. Um, what we do is we take all of them and understand what is, what is good and useful and, and where they are best applied. And then the, we, we customize together um, the pieces of those frameworks that are most relevant for a given challenge uh, that our client has. Uh, and so, you know, there's no one black box approach. It is always customized. It, all, it is always pulling from a broad toolkit um, from the startup world. Um, and that, that's how we designed against Cargill. And I think it's, it's very important to emphasize um, there's one project that we're going to talk about that got to those really cool results of having a, pro a product sold in, um, in in just over a month. However, that was built on a, a longer process of us really engaging with Cargill and Cargill really investing in their people and in their processes to get to the point where something like that would be remotely possible. Um, so, you know, it started with a mindset change from, from Cargill. Um, and Corey, feel free to jump in wherever you, you see the opportunity here. But um, to actually, you know, put a stake in the ground and say we want to operate more entrepreneurially. Um, we then brought in and, and did kind of an immersion or training with a core group of their team. Uh, and you saw pictures of many of them um, that they knew were going to have to be leading this process. Um, and, and from there, we took the learning out of the classroom and really learned by doing. And there were three sprints that we did. Um, and this is not a traditional sprint by, by any sense of the word. These were um, three-day engagements, but still 100% focus, high velocity, high octane um, team engagement, uh, very uh, consumer driven, even though consumer means different things uh, at different levels of the B2B business. Um, but uh, really there was kind of the first sprint, us, uh, the garage group, um, took mostly the leadership role in and, and really Cargo participated and, and kind of um, you know, saw it in action. The second one uh, was really a co-leadership model where, where Cargo kind of started stepping in, started taking that leadership role. And then the third one was, was co-led, but we added this extra layer of uh, minimum viable product um, uh, executions. Uh, and that actually was the products that you saw go out into market. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, Corey, any thoughts on, on kind of the, the larger context that this one project took, took place in? Yeah, I guess I would say that I think what was really important in changing the mindset was the, the training that the garage, that Dennis and others on his team uh, did for us, uh, really, a, truly a partnership uh, mentality. It wasn't just, hey, let's do these sprints, we'll plan everything, and you guys just participate. Um, they've done multiple training sessions with us. They've done, done lunch and learns. Um, it, it goes beyond actually doing the sprints, but actually uh, understanding new ways of doing things and changing the culture so that we can apply some of those principles uh, on our own or in the other work that we do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the uh, disruptive innovation team that we recently created and uh, it's employing a lot of the principles uh, that we learned from the garage group. Yeah, very cool. Um, do you want to talk to the bullets kind of on, on why, why did you guys want to have an internal sprint capability? Like, you know, I can, I can talk about why it's so important because I, I'm on an agency that does this kind of innovation. So of course I'm going to say that, but what were you seeing, Corey, that, that made you so excited to bring kind of a sprint approach or an entrepreneurial approach to cargo innovation? Yeah, when I started, I, I talked to a lot of leaders and, and my peers and asked about, you know, Cargill's reputation uh, with, our, with our customers. And uh, although Cargill is known for a, a lot of uh, really good things from, you know, quality and reliability and customer service, the one thing that people told me that Cargill wasn't really known for and didn't have a reputation for was, uh, was speed, uh, especially as it relates to innovation. So uh, that was sort of the, the background and the context for wanting to develop uh, a capability that, that was very um, apparent in the organization. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, as we've 
been doing this for the last 18 months, uh, I think we've actually uh, raised a lot of eyebrows across broader Cargill and um, brought some some energy and and I, I've been kind of on the road doing a roadshow presentation to a lot of different groups around Cargill because they're really interested in what we're doing and and they want to try to emulate it. So uh, that was kind of a unintended uh, benefit uh, of having the sprint capability. But but ultimately we want to we want to move faster. We want to be more proactive. Uh, and we want to be more agile. Mm -hmm. um, so then the, the, the specific opportunity that we're going to talk about today um, is outlined here on the screen, which the, the, the challenge was to develop a pipeline of premium product innovation that by simultaneously addressing both meaningful independent restaurant operator jobs to be done and satisfying meaningful consumer needs and trends will help drive key distributor um, and customer innovation programs and priorities. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of layers in this, in this kind of model. Why don't you talk about that, Corey? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically B to B to C here. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I think that's important as, as you see the rest of the presentation, why we did what we did. Um, so yeah, selling to just, we want to ultimately sell some of our product to those broadline distributors who then would sell to independent restaurant operators, uh, which is a little bit different than our chain business. Uh, and then ultimately they're obviously serving food to their guests. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is where i oh, go ahead. Distribution is a big business for us. Um, so uh, this is a really uh, important uh, and strategic project. It was also focused um, um, more on our cooked meat segment of the business. Um, so it was a very important uh, segment for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we, you know, we talked about the consumer and that can mean many different things depending on your specific situation. You know, there is that end consumer that's eating the burger on the plate. Um, but you know, the, you also need to pay attention to those needs and trends affecting the restaurant owner operators. Um, uh, and even in some senses, the broadline distributors are your consumers in ways. Um, and I, part of what led us to, you know, this focus that you'll hear on, on restaurant owner operators is we asked the question of whose voice is missing from the conversation right now. Um, and, and you guys had a lot of great research on the end consumer needs and end consumer trends. Um, and certainly you, you heard from the broadline distributors what they wanted. Um, but the restaurant owner operators were this group that no one had really thought to talk to. Um, and that we just didn't know much about. Yeah, that's a great point, Dennis. Um, so the approach that we took, um, and we can kind of talk through this together, um, you know, we, we started by really assessing the landscape, um, you know, having you guys go out and, and generate empathy by actually interacting with the category and, and talking to some of these other operators, um, and then having lots of con uh, conversations with uh, customers as well. Yeah, that was really good for us. Uh, there are some people on our team that work in food service that have never been back a house in a restaurant. Mm. And so um, getting the opportunity to do that uh, was valuable in and of itself. Really brought some of that empathy. And it's, it's so valuable to not just jump straight into ideation, you know, even, even when you're an expert, as it were, in your category. Uh, to spend that time developing empathy and to spend that time really grounding yourself um, in the existing knowledge and the, the consumer voice, um, you know, or, or the operator voice in, in this sense, and to, and to start ideating from that, that strong foundation, which then there was that two-day uh, innovation sprint. I think I said three days earlier, we even got it down from there, um, where, where we came together, you know, armed with this inspiration, armed with this expertise, um, and, and the background information and turn those very rapidly into uh, pain points, which is just expressing the, the problems and the needs in the way a consumer would, translated those pain points into jobs to be done, which um, kind of detaches the consumer need from the specific solutions that they might be thinking through um, and gives you kind of more of a broader lens for the problem to be solved. Um, and then developed those uh, solutions, developed specific ideas 
uh, based on the, the most important jobs to be done. Um, and man, I, you guys, I remember our, we, we have the numbers for this later on, but it's amazing how much you can generate in, over the course of two days uh, when you come equipped with the right processes and the right inspiration. Yeah, what I love about the, the, that sprint process is it's very customer or consumer focused uh, throughout. And I think as, a, as an insights person, um, that really uh, spoke to me and resonated with me. And it's very logical for those involved to move from pain points to jobs to be done to then developing ideas that deliver on those jobs, uh, all the while incorporating uh, consumer or customer feedback overnight or in real time. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of touch points, making sure that we're staying true to, to the jobs to be done. Mm -hmm. And then once we'd, we'd kind of used all of that to isolate down to the top ideas, um, which we'll talk about how we, how we even did that with the, with the owner operators, um, we actually determined success criteria for a minimum viable product test. Um, and so we didn't just say, hey, how do we go you know, make this product all the way right away? Uh, we said, what are, the, what are the make or break assumptions that we need to go learn about? Um, and then what do we need to do to learn about them, uh, which may or may not include kind of completely creating the final product, um, which led us into prototyping. And, and Corey, I'll let you talk about prototyping and selling because you were probably even, even closer than I was to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, it's still amazing to me. I can't say enough good things about our R&D our uh, and culinary group that really rallied and developed six prototypes in the course of a, of a month uh, to six weeks. It was pretty amazing. And I think one of the keys to that for us was they were involved from day one, from where to play. They were involved in the innovation sprint. They were a part of it. And so it wasn't like we were handing off to some other group to say, hey, go make this stuff for us. They were pretty jazzed. They were pretty excited. Uh, so that, so that, that, that was, uh, I, I was like personally amazed. I, I didn't think that, um, that we could even pull that off. And uh, the, the Dennis and his team, uh, in terms of logistics, we were making you know, some of this product in different parts of the country and shipping it to Minneapolis uh, they, they just helped immensely in sort of managing all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then talk about the selling process and just, you know, how the, the insights and the in-market, um, you know, data or insight that you were able to go to the broadline distributors with, how did that impact the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't uh, present in the room, but in, talking to the people that were, I, I don't think that our customers had ever really seen hardly any of their customers come in and talk about, here's what we did with operators. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about what we did with operators, but it was, you know, we did it very quickly. Um, they were with us throughout the sprint. We were in their restaurants, front of house, back of house. And I think when we were able to bring those insights and that learning, it really helped influence um, their willingness and excitement to take on those items. It was, uh, it was really a game changer. Mm -hmm. so, so by the numbers, just to give you guys an idea of, of kind of the ground we covered, again, with about a month of prep and then, and then really a month from ideation through, through selling in, um, we identified 128 operator pain points um, that were translated into 54 jobs to be done. Um, once those were tested uh, and, and we kind of identified the top jobs to be done, we used that to generate 72 ideas and then narrowed down to the top 34 or so that we submitted for overnight testing. And so we were actually, even, even within the speed that we were moving, we were still going back to the end consumer and getting their voice heard um, throughout this process. That led to 11 ideas that were like the, the cream of the crop, the, the top best ideas um, that we had the, the owner operators that work with us uh, select for MVP testing, uh, which ultimately led uh, into two items fully sold in and two more sales that are pending right now. Um, and, and yeah, we'll, 
Corey, I'll let you talk a little bit more specifically about the process we used with the restaurant operators. Yeah, so this was really the, the innovative part, I think, about what we did is uh, we recruited uh, six independent restaurant operators uh, to participate in our sprint. They participated for two half days with us. So uh, they sat in the room with, you know, the 10 to 12 of us that were there. Uh, they they uh, gave us insight around what their pain points truly were, about what their jobs to be done were. Uh, they kept us honest. Uh, it really was a game, cha game changer in terms of um, what we came up with, because if we hadn't involved them, I know we wouldn't have gone in the direction that we did with the solutions. And then they actually uh, uh, ideated solutions with us, uh, which was great. Um, they, uh, um, it, it, was, it was actually fun. Um, and I think they, via some of their comments, they were actually uh, honored really that, uh, that a company like Cargill was asking uh, their opinion um so uh even though we gave them a fairly small incentive i think at the end of the day they probably would have uh they would have done it for free and what so what we did at the end of the second day of the sprint you know we narr uh, dennis said we narrowed down to uh, six ideas we actually did uh, a white elephant exercise with them which was kind of a fun activity where uh, we drew up an order and then they got to pick the ideas that they would personally want to have in their restaurant and so you can see some of the photos here. They each had to pick an idea off the wall and say why they were interested in that idea. And then the next, uh, the next person could steal or pick another idea. So uh, it was really fun for them to, it was really fun for us and the team and them to, they were kind of fighting for the idea that they had a lot of passion for, which was learning in and of itself. And I forget who, but I believe we had one even come up later on and be like, hey, I, I know I didn't win this idea, but can I still do it for you guys? Like, I still, I still want to experiment that. I want it so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Chef Paul, I think it was. He, he's like, what? I, I didn't get to choose this idea. Or maybe it was an idea that we didn't even prioritize. And he, oh, he, yeah. uh, he just had a lot of heart for it. So he, he did a couple ideas instead of in addition to the one he, uh, he selected. Yeah, and I'll harken back and say, you know, when, when you're willing to ask kind of whose voice isn't in the conversation right now, um, their insight is always powerful and they always get very, very passionate um, when you do involve them. Um, so that turned into actual products that were on the menu and, and, and sold, not just served, but sold to consumers. Yeah, and I think what what's was a really important step at the end of that day too is we after the, the, the chefs selected the ideas they wanted to have in their restaurant, we sat down with them and we said, what would need to be true for this to become a permanent item uh, in your restaurant? And so we developed those test criteria, those success criteria with them. And some of them were back of house metrics and some of them were front of house metrics. And so, before we even went to their restaurant, we knew uh, what we needed to be aware of and, and what the success criteria were, which was really important to do on the front end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have that clarity going in, it makes the, the kind of persuasiveness of the result coming out that much better. Yeah. I think we have more pictures of, of kind of what the line yeah, so looks like. These were ideas that were actually on menu inserts. Uh, we had a caterer that served one of our products. And what was, uh, what was really cool is, uh, you know, our team, when these items were being sold or served, our team was, was there. Our whole cross-functional team, insights, marketing, R&D, culinary. Uh, we would go back of house. If they said one of the, the criteria, for example, was, Whenever I have a new item, I get my staff together, we try it. And, it, and if the staff says they would recommend that item, that's one of the success criteria. So if we knew that in advance, we would actually go to that staff cutting um, back of house. And then uh, in the restaurants, 
the manager or the chef would give us a heads up when someone actually ordered the idea. And then after the, the, pers the, the guest, the restaurant guest uh, ate uh, the menu item, we would go up to their table and sort of pose as management and ask how much they enjoyed their meal. So our team was really immersed, really engaged, uh, both back of house and front of house, which is really neat. Mm -hmm. And man, I, I think that is a, a great example of where courage and in, in kind of the entrepreneurial spirit comes into play, right? Um, that was that was not overly orchestrated. We kind of had the idea of like, well, how do we how do we get you guys in conversation with the end consumer for the test where it was important to get feedback from them? I know we can just say that you're a manager and and you know to do just what you described, but you know that's that's an uncomfortable place to be in. That that's scary. That takes a lot of courage to go out <laughs> there and uh, it's an acting gig, you know, <laughs> saying hey, I'm yeah, totally. And there's you know there's so many ways that could go wrong. There's that you know at least you know that that's what the voice in your head says um but when, you know when you engage with the right mindset and with the right tools it's it's just a human talking to another human um where the insights are happening and that that is always worth the the scariness i guess or worth the courage that it takes putting in to get those insights in that way was just incredible yeah and, and by the way it's fun <laughs> yeah, yeah you're not you're not sitting in your office or your cube. You're actually in the action. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, you say you have people back of house, so you hear a, a consumer say, I'll have, I'll have the mushroom chicken and all of a sudden back of house is cheering and they're wondering why. But uh, yeah, you get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this comes from uh, Cam Snazza, who's one of the marketing managers who kind of helped see these through um, and was in the room, like you mentioned, for, for the sell-in. Um, to the broadline distributors, but uh, he said when our distributors saw that these ideas came from their customers, the restaurant owners, they gave us much more credit for the validity of our ideas, and we were quick to find ways to partner. Um, so yeah, why don't, why don't you talk about kind of what you learned in, in broad strokes from all of this uh, and from the entire yeah, uh, and then I yeah, you know, those who are typing and asking, we will wrap up with with questions, um, so we'll probably have a. 15-ish minutes for, for questions or thereabouts, depending on how long we go. Um, so please type in questions to the app um, and we have someone that'll, that'll translate them over to us, um, but please don't hesitate. But yeah, I'll, Corey, I'll let you talk this slide. Yeah, so big picture, I, you know, what we've learned. Um, one, you can move fast and get consumer or customer feedback along the way. I think that's been key. Uh, we're not trading off one for the other. I think sometimes in organizations, uh, insights can be seen as, oh gosh, we have to do that. That's going to slow our timeline. That just slows us down. Um, but we've been able to prove that uh, we can move fast and gain consumer or customer feedback along the way. Um, involving the voice of your customers. Customers can be a game changer. So there's the B2B or the B2B to C aspect where you know we've realized some positive momentum with our sales force specifically when we can go have conversations with our customers about their specific shoppers or their specific guests uh, which is really powerful uh, we can get the saleable product faster than we thought uh, i think operating in a food service environment definitely has its advantages in doing that um, you know we talked about transactional real life environment so I love research where the, the person doesn't realize it's research. Um, you know, a lot of, when you think about surveys or online qualitative that we do, people know that they're participating in research. It's not necessarily real life. Uh, but ordering a menu item off of a menu and trying it for um, a customer using something new back of house, that's real life. Uh, and I think it just amplifies the learning. And then finally, it's like I said a few times, it's whenever we do these sprints, people are like, oh, that was, that was fun. I don't get the chance to be creative or courageous or uh, so different than what I typically do. And we, we never have any issues uh, getting people uh, to participate in our sprints. 
Uh, we have a lot of people that actually uh, ask us if they can get the experience. So it's been a lot of fun for our team and really helped uh, change the culture. Yeah, I, whenever I start a sprint, I'll, I'll promise people and say, we, we are going to work you really, really hard for the next several days but you're gonna walk away each day feeling more energized than you ever do in a normal day of work. And I, I have yet to anyone to have anyone tell me I'm, I'm full of it. Um, it. It seems to be the universal reaction of like, man, that was, that was hard, that was difficult, that was crazy, and man, was that fun and energizing. So I, uh, I agree with that. Um, so going forward, what are you guys, where are you guys kind of focusing? Are you with me, Corey? I'm sorry, I was on mute there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so what we'd what we'd like to do, and what we've uh, been entertaining, is doing sprints with our customers. So uh, I guess my invitation to uh, anyone that's listening right now that is uh, um, a Cargill customer or buys products from Cargill, specifically Cargill Protein, ideally, we would. Uh, we'd love to uh, do a joint sprint with you. Uh, so that's something other parts of Cargill have started to do that, but, uh, and we wanna do that in Cargill Protein too. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that we uh, formed a uh, adjacent and transformational innovation team uh, about six months ago. And uh, they're employing a lot of these principles uh, in kind of their ways of working. Uh, we have a innovation center of excellence uh, that we partner with and we've been sharing uh, some of these best practices. Cargill Protein has been a bit of a test bed for some of that. And uh, we've really built out, especially from an insights perspective, a suite of agile uh, capabilities and, and partners uh, where we can get uh, quick, quick turn feedback uh, to help aid our judgment. And I think that's important to say is that, you know, when use a lot of these agile techniques for quick feedback it's we're not we're not following that research out the window it's it's merely you know aiding our judgment and informing our decision uh, and so uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from our cross-functional partners about uh, the speed with which we operate which if you remember all the way back to the beginning that was one of the the fundamental goals so Kudos yep. to you guys on that front. Uh, we'll close. We'll close kind of the prepared section with uh, a quote from Chuck Gitkin, who is the marketing leader of Protein, um, and and he talks about that speed and agility. And he says it's the speed and agility you get from this methodology is not historically the way we've worked. These new capabilities are helping transform us, um, which is which is music to my ears, Corey. I think it's it's music to yours as well. Yeah, so Chuck is my boss, and it's always nice to hear those words from your boss. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot over to questions. We've got a, a bunch here, um, and I'll I'll kind of throw them out, and we can we can answer them as we go. Uh, the first one was about jobs to be done, and asking if we have any specific examples of, of jobs to be done that we uh, we arrived at or that we focused on during the process. So Corey, I'll let you decide what is worth sharing or, or what you're able to share on that. Any specific jobs to be done that you feel like are, are worth talking about? Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into specifics, but I would say a couple things. One, having the independent restaurant operators there was key. Um, I, 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 the one thing I would say is, you know, there are some, you can provide restaurant operators certain levels of finish in the product that they buy, you know. It, um, and I think what we learned uh, by interacting with the operators uh, was uh, interesting and very relevant uh, in that regard. And I think we would have been, we would have gone in a different direction had they not been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question was, uh, was online quant testing part of the approach? Um, and I can answer, yeah, yeah, it absolutely was. Um, you heard me mention that once we had ideas, we tested them overnight with consumers, uh, and that's with the end consumers. Um, so we were getting multiple kind of realms of feedback, as it were, on the ideas. One from the owner operators that were there live with us in, in session, and then one from uh, overnight quantitative testing with end consumers on the ideas that were kind of generated in partnership 
with the owner operators. And uh, you know that that methodology, uh, Corey, you kind of talked about it, like you know, involving the voice of the consumer does not need to slow you down. Um, and be it through you know having people live with you, doing overnight research in a more scrappy way, um, having consumers on iPads, we've done in the past, but there are so many tools available to you to to bring in um, the consumer voice in a quick way uh, and in a responsive way. Um, that you should you should never have to worry about about that slowing you down or, or you know I think it, there's never a situation where you can say I don't have time to talk to the consumer as it were. Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, it's always a fun part of the process when we do the two or three day sprints where we do the overnight testing, and then you know because the the, the team works on the ideas together and they submit the ideas and then they get to come back in the morning. It's sort of like Christmas. You know, which ideas resonated, which ones were appealing. Was it the, the idea that my team worked on? It's kind of fun. Yeah, people get competitive. It's a, it's a good time. <laughs> uh, next up, let's see. What, what kinds of feedback activities were most helpful for your team in this process? Were there particular activities that were more important for your team than others? Um, I, I can, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was, I think the obvious one is, is having the, the restaurant operators actually sitting with our team. Uh, that was, that was extremely valuable. Uh, I, I believe Dennis, we did a panel with them, mm -hmm. uh, where everyone, you know, asked questions, uh, that was really valuable. And then, uh, each of them sort of sat with our team and did activities when we broke up into, I think we broke up into four groups. So we'd have one or two uh, uh, restaurant operators with us at each table. Uh, so that, that, was, uh, that was really valuable. Yeah. I think there is something powerful about that mix of a broader panel where it was kind of the operators as a group to Cargill as a group blended with the more one-on-one -on -one interaction where everyone was sitting kind of at smaller tables and it was more just human to human. Like, um, you know, having that, the multiple lenses on the same conversation uh, led to different insights. And then I've, I've said a couple times in this presentation alone, I really believe like oftentimes the most powerful voice is the one that's not usually there. Um, and if you can ever find or realize where there's, there's a stakeholder or consumer, et cetera, in your equation that just isn't being heard from, um, you're always going to learn something new when you bring them in. Uh, let's see here. What was one of the biggest assumptions you managed to invalidate? And Corey, I think you alluded to this a little bit. I, I, I know I'm thinking of something very specific, but you alluded to this a little bit earlier on. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, this level of, of finish, uh, you know, there's certain things that you can do up front to, to help from a, a time saving or a labor saving perspective. And I think, um, our assumption on that was was wrong, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> well, and it, and it's if all your, hypo oh, go if all your uh, assumptions or hypotheses are are validated, then uh, it kind of takes the value of going through the process. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, you should be worried if you ever don't find something unexpected. Um, but I remember even in early conversations before we ever you know had had the owner operators in the room. That, that was just such an assumption um, and, and so accepted in the way that everyone thought we, we adopted it, you guys have adopted it. And a lot of the early ideation kind of had that assumption at the heart of it. Um, and had we not had the owner operators there um, to very clearly uh, prove that assumption wrong, I think our, our ideas would have been nowhere near the quality that they were. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we, we would have spun off in a direction that operators would not have found appealing. Absolutely. Well, and, and we would have done that thinking we were, we were doing them a huge favor, which then down the road has you come across as tone deaf and it's kind of this double whammy on, uh, on your innovation. Um, so yeah, it creates yeah. a little there. Uh, could we shed any light on surprises that we experienced through the customer discovery process? 
Um, so what else, what else was just, uh, surprising about bringing in the, the customers? This is more a, a discovery about the process, but I think, um, you know, we, we've talked internally about how much the operators enjoyed being a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was a, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, yeah, I won't get into specific learning that we gained, but I, but I think that point about involving consumers or customers in the process, uh, it's fun. They enjoy it. Uh, these chefs felt honored. They felt listened to. Um, so th that was a nice surprise from a process perspective. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll cite a surprise as, um, and I think this is something that's unique to having a, a consumer that is, you know, the restaurant owner operator where they are, they are kind of on the business side. Um, but how well they were able to able to come in and kind of speak to the business and, and strategy side of what we were doing. Like, you know, not only were they excited to be there, but they were able to engage with us on the level of jobs to be done and engage with us on like, well, how do we find a, a version of the solution that makes sense for you and for us? Um, and I think a lot of times when you're speaking with pure end consumers, they're not, you know, they're not really ready to go there. Um, you don't want to just bring in a consumer and, and ask them to write your copy for you, essentially, you know. Um, but when you're engaging with a with a consumer or a stakeholder in the value chain that has a level of expertise that has seen the business side, um, their ability to speak into those things is much, much higher than I would have assumed going in. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that wraps it up for now. If anyone will, will, will you know, um, wait a little bit. If anyone else wants to fire off a question, you're welcome to. Um, and then certainly you can see contact information there on the screen. Um, the conversation does not have to end here. Uh, as Corey said, anyone that's a potential customer of Cargo, um, they're excited to work with. We're excited to either partner with people or, or be the driving force to build this capability with anyone who's interested at the Garage Group. Um, and, and let's absolutely keep the conversation going. Um, oh, here we go. We got one more. See, you create the space and it happens. Um, <laughs> ah, here you go. Did your product development labs already have the ingredients for the prototypes? How could they respond so quickly in terms of logistics? I don't even know. <laughs> they, they blew up. <laughs> Witchcraft. Yeah, I would, I would say in this case, um, we have the ability to be pretty agile with our, our product supply. Um, and so, and, and pretty custom in our innovation center. Uh, so we, we were able to figure out how to create all these prototypes, um, at our innovation center, um, which is, you know, food safe and, and, uh, up to snuff from that perspective. So, um, we had, we had to get a creative in a couple of cases, uh, and do very small batches, but yeah, we, all of the solutions uh, that we developed, we had the, uh, the raw materials for, which, which definitely helped from a speed perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, one of the things that, that the garage group will, will talk to clients about is the idea that um, seemingly inefficient design um, on your product line that gives you more agility um, will open up so many larger opportunities in the, in the long run, um, where just kind of kind of planning with the assumption that you're going to be asked to do something that you can't anticipate, um, and, and keeping a modicum of, of flexibility, um, or you know having having a center that has that, or or just kind of knowing what your process around agility is, um, opens up so much in terms of innovation. It's always extremely worth it, even if it comes at the cost of some efficiency up front. Uh, let's see here. I think, I think that's, that gets us pretty close to time. And, uh, so we'll, we'll say our thank yous. First off, Corey, thank you for doing this again. Uh, I can't believe I didn't scare you off, but it's always a pleasure uh, chatting with you and certainly chatting with you about this incredible project. Um, it was great. So thank you for being here and for doing this. Well, yeah, thanks for inviting me, Dennis. It's, it's a fun topic. I, I enjoy talking about it and, talking about the success that we had through our partnership. So yeah, happy to do it. 
And, and thank you to everyone who's, who's watching on the webinar, or if you've come to this um, after the fact, uh, please reach out. Um, let's keep the conversation going, and, and uh, be it on the Cargill side or the Garage Group side, we are excited to partner with you. So please, please reach out, uh, and we'll be excited to talk to you when you do. Uh, thank you again, and then we'll see you around. Thank you. All right, thanks.